Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13 is the text of Scripture we'll be studying this morning. Follow along as I read God's Word. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Lord, Spirit of God, please give us an ear to hear what you say. May we listen, may we believe, may we think, may we respond in a way that brings glory to you. We ask that your Spirit would do only what your Spirit can do over this congregation, and that your Holy Spirit would illuminate these truths and apply them to our lives and that we would be encouraged by the church at Philippi. Help us, Spirit of God, Holy Father, three in one. We pray that your name would be glorified through this text and through this study this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, like I said, we've down to the last two churches, and the Philadelphia here is a church in Asia Minor. It is not a church in eastern United States of America. However, the church, the city in the eastern United States of America is named after this church. And so we would do well to understand the meaning of this, even in our nation in which we live. Ephesus, though, in review, thinking about this, Ephesus, the church in the sprawling chief city, had stood firm, but had grown cold, and love was foreign to them. Smyrna, the church in the beautiful city, was beleaguered and tired, but faithful and enduring. Pergamum, the church in the political capital with its powerful connection to Rome, was standing firm despite persecution, but they had begun to tolerate sinful worship and practices in the church, and there is a word of judgment against them. Thyatira, the church in the sprawling, unguarded city, though they had grown in love, service, faith, and endurance, were allowing idolatry, immorality, and the depths of Satan to lead her. Sardis, the church we looked at last week, much like their city, ancient, proud, and without watching, had slowly become a dead church and with little spiritual life at all. Philadelphia and Laodicea are the only two that still remain for us to study, given by the Spirit of God. One cannot find, as I said before, any more two churches on this list that are polar opposites. Laodicea, the great church that, that, that though he loves her, literally makes God want to vomit. In Philadelphia, the small church that, like Smyrna, has nothing negative said about her, but a church near to the heart of God. The only one that Jesus uses the unique term and, and says this phrase, I love you, in that way. But as we have been doing, with, in order to understand this text of Scripture and this church and hear what God has for us, we want to begin with understanding a little bit more about the city in which the church resides. Philadelphia, uh, modern-day Turkey, Alice Hayhir, uh, rests at the end of a broad valley 
southeast of Sardis. It's not a naturally defensible city, but a strategic city for trade. Uh, Philadelphia finds itself as the trade junction for the regions of Mysia, Lydia, and Phrygia. <coughs> the postal route from Rome to Troas passed through Philadelphia and went on northward. Um, thus, Philadelphia often carried the title of Gateway to the East. Uh, north of the city was a large volcanic plain that produced rich soil perfect for growing vineyards. The city was fairly prosperous and wealthy. The one big problem in Philadelphia, in the city, was that the area was prone to earthquakes. Uh, just like its neighbor, Sardis, uh, Philadelphia had suffered greatly from the great earthquake of AD 17. Last week we mentioned that Pliny, uh, the historian, had said it was the, it was the worst disaster in human memory. This gigantic earthquake. And, and like Sardis, Emperor Tiberius had helped to rebuild Philadelphia. However, Sardis recovered quickly. Philadelphia did not. Many citizens chose not to rebuild in the city and retreated out to the countryside, living in tents, fearful for the next big earthquake to come, looking for that big day of affliction that was going to come upon the city once again and decimate them and kill their family and friends. Part of this was, was due to their just fears of the earthquake, but another reason is uh, uh, Philadelphia experienced many tremors before and after the great earthquake and had multiple earthquakes that continued for many hundreds of years in that area. And so the people of Philadelphia began to live in fear of the great affliction, and thus they retreated. The name Philadelphia is interesting. Of course, if you've had an American history class, you know what the name means, City of Brotherly Love. And it's true. The city, though, did not get this, or brotherly love is what the word means, the city did not get this name because of any particular qualities of the city, rather of its founder, uh, Eumenes II, he was king of Pergamum and ruled the region. He had allied himself with the Romans in defeating Antiochus the Great, the Grecian conqueror. And in allying, allying himself with the Romans, he had gone, come under their good graces and he was given all Asia Minor to rule. His brother, Attalus II, was fiercely loyal to him. Upon hearing rumors that Eumenides was assassinated, Attalus took the crown as his brother. But when his brother showed up and returned, discovering it was just a rumor that he had been killed, Attalus immediately gave the crown back and without any question served his brother as king and gave up the royalty. Another occasion, the Roman alliance suspected Eumenes of conspiracy and sought to get Attalus to turn on his brother with them, but he refused in the face of the Roman oppression and remained loyal to his brother. And so, Attalus was given by contemporaries and by history books as knowing Attalus Philadelphus, or Attalus, the lover of his brother. The city was either founded by Eumenides or Attalus. History is unclear. But the honor on this family because of this loyalty is clear. In truth, Philadelphia bore its name well, though. It was a loyal city. Loyal to the region. Loyal to the Romans and the imperial court. Often the coins from the city, uh, molded in the city, have two brothers paying homage to the Roman deity. Um, to, the, to the, the Caesar of Rome. Philadelphia had many temples and religious festivals, so many, in fact, that it became known as Little Athens. And like Athens, religious pluralism, as Luke defines it in Acts 17.21 when he speaks of Athens, and he says, and, and relating Paul's discourse on Mars Hill, that he says, for all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear of some new thing. And Philadelphia was like that. What's the newest religion? What's the newest philosophy? Well, this is neat. Let's talk about this one. Let's believe this one. Let's take them all and put them all together. And so it was a very a city with an amalgamated religion, loyal to the imperial cult of worshiping the emperor, but loyal pretty much to just the gods. When Tiberius gave such generous help to Sardis and Philadelphia, the citizens of Philadelphia were so grateful that they did something unique. They renamed their city Neo-Caesarea. In other words, they, the new Caesars. 
because the city was struggling so much after the earthquake. However, no new coins were minted, and so they forgot about that name, and that name became back to Philadelphia after a while. In that time period, uh, rules changed in the Roman Empire, and to change the name of your city was a privilege granted to that city by the emperor. About 20 years before John writes this letter, during the reign of Vespasian, of the Flavian family, uh, Philadelphia was granted the privilege and honor to change its name. And so it changed its name once again to Flavia, in honor of the emperor Vespasian. And why do I give all these details? To show you the, the temperature of the city. So it is like, very loyal to Rome. So loyal, in fact, they were willing to change their name. And they, and they earned the honor to change their name from Philadelphia to Flavia, to honor the Roman emperor who they viewed as a god. It also has an impact because you'll notice a couple of these little details that will pop up in the letter that John writes. And now he promises to give them a new name. <laughs> and to write his name, the city of his city's name on them. The church. We'll get to that later though in our study. Philadelphia was a city loyal to religious pluralism and notably the imperial cult and they were loyal to the concept of piety and religion so long as it fit in the secular scope of all that they desired. A city that probably would be considered much like our culture today. Filled with pluralism Filled with, with a desire to take, take bits and parts and buffet religion. To take bits and parts of whatever made you happy and to bring it into your belief system. In cities like that, in cultures like that, those who are loyal to Christ don't fare well. Because if there is one great enemy to pluralism, religious pluralism, it is the dogmatism of Jesus. Because Jesus spoke very exclusively. Jesus said very hard things. Jesus said, no, no, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Greeks and Romans said, no, no, you can go through Zeus, you can go through Apollo, Aphrodite. Hey, they're all good. Even the Jews have a point in their Jehovah worship. But Jesus says, no, there is one way to God. It's through me, through Jesus. Christians who take seriously Jesus' words do not fare well in cultures filled with pluralism. Sardis was the same way. I'm sorry, not Sardis. Smyrna was the same way. So too was Philadelphia. Perhaps that's why both Smyrna and Philadelphia had large Jewish populations. Um, because they were allowed to live there, allowed to do their synagogue worship, so long as they did not infringe upon the market or any other problem going on, not out there you know, proselytizing. After all, faith is a very private matter. Keep it to yourself. And so the Jewish populations thrived in Smyrna and thrived in Philadelphia. And they also, in these letters, we find those two cities are the cities where it's mentioned that they're called the synagogue of Satan. Because these Jewish in name, not necessarily in heart, serving Jehovah, um, they persecuted the church of God. They attacked those Christians. They were against them. In letters to both these churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, Jesus has very strong things to say about these Jews in name only who are not his people but are really the synagogue of Satan. And he calls them liars. The very thing Jesus said about the Pharisees while he engaged in earthly ministries. He told them, you are of your father the devil, a liar from the beginning. Indeed, both churches in Smyrna and Philadelphia are only commended by God as well. These are the only two churches that have nothing negative spoken about them too. Because of the faithfulness in the presence of their anti-Christian hostility and hatred. And might I just pause before we even get to the text of Scripture this morning and encourage you, the members, my friends, members of Grace Baptist Church, we live in a hostile culture to exclusive dogma from Jesus. Our world does not like to hear Jesus is the only way. 
And because they hate to hear that, rest assured, they're going to hate to, he they're going to, hate to hear you speak it, and they're going to in turn hate to be quick to hate you for it. Jesus said this. He said, do not marvel if the world hates you. The servant's not greater than his master. And if they hate the master, won't they hate the servant? The reason why I'm sure that many churches, many Christians do not face this fear and do not face this, this persecution and this hatred and this hostility is because maybe they're not the servants of the master. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble. Persecution will afflict you. And the two churches in Revelation that have nothing negative said about them are the two most persecuted churches in the list. And yet we strive and we hate the thought of persecution against us and our children. And yet maybe that is what we need to strengthen the church of God in America. Maybe we need to see what's true and what's not true and who's true and who's not true. Maybe there needs to be a great purging like God did in Smyrna and like God did in Philadelphia. Maybe it would wake us up. Back to the text of Scripture, though. As Jesus does with all of the other letters, He introduces Himself in some um, unique fashion. And He does so here in chapter 3, verse, verse 7 to this church. He introduces Himself as He that is holy, He that is true, and He that hath the key of David. Those three qualities is how he describes himself. Now, in the original language, it's even more emphatic because it's this, uh, the uh, uh, substantival adjectives. In other words, it could be translated, thus says the Holy One, thus says the True One, thus says the One having the key of David. In other words, it's descriptive of the One and only who is holy, the One and only who is true. Not just one who, who bears a characteristic, but in his very nature, in his very essence, is nothing but holy and nothing but true. And that's how he introduces himself in the beginning. The Holy One, a term used to refer to God alone. Jesus is, Christ is speaking. Now catch the significance of this. Jesus is speaking and he says, Thus says the Holy One. That term in the scripture, that substantival use of that adjective, the Holy One, is only ever referencing God. So if Jesus says, thus I'm speaking and I'm the Holy One, Jesus is saying very clearly, I am God. That's what he's saying. You cannot escape. I, I say to those who seek to say, well, Jesus was you know, a, a, like, a, like a junior God or a son of God or, or uh, you know, he wasn't really God, kind of like you know, kind of a man that became God. I say, you can't believe that if you read Revelation 1 through 4. 1 through 5, actually. You just can't. You have to either take the words and change your belief, or you have to change the words. It's incompatible. Jesus is God. He refers to himself as the Holy One. And if this is the case, Jesus is either speaking the truth, or he's a liar. There is no middle ground. He is speaking the truth. And what's fascinating, that's the next description he gives. He says, I am the true one. Now this construction is the same way. The holy one. The true one. And this idea of the true one is not that just what he says is true. Although that's the case. That's not what he's emphasizing. He's not saying, and I have or I possess truth. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't just say, I possess some truth or I know what's true or I have the answers. He says, no, I am the truth. I am the embodiment of truth. You want to know what is true? That's me. I'm true. And so it's more than just, I speak truth. Rather, it is, I am the authentic, real God. There is no others. They're all the rest are pretenders. As the Old Testament says, all the rest are idols. They're all pretenders. There's one God, and it's me. I'm holy, and I'm the true one. The only one. That phrase, the true and the substantival adjective, has the idea of saying, as the confession says, Jesus is very God of very God. The true one. He is the embodied of, embodiment of truth because there is nothing in his being that is insincere. It is upon this basis we trust the word of God because it's what Jesus has spoken. 
And since he embodies truth, what he says must be true. In fact, that is a great way to understand why we know the Bible to be true, because Jesus says it is. And if Jesus says it's true, and it's not true in all its parts, Jesus was a liar, not God, we might as well go home. You understand the importance of the infallibility of Scripture then? If it's wrong, the entire thing is wrong. Jesus is a liar. There is nothing else. This book is either the words of the true one, the holy one, the record of Jesus, or it's the biggest fraud perpetrated on humanity. There is no room in Christianity for pluralistic thinking. You either believe the Bible or you don't. That's it. It's either the truth or it's not. And we must be careful. If Jesus is the Holy One, the true one, and He has said His Word is true, He said it's the only way to be sanctified. It's through His Word. His Word is truth. If this is the case then all the attempts to redefine and reimagine and reinterpret and refashion the clear teachings of God's Word to make it more palpable to the modern mind is an attack on the very character and nature of God. To attack the Word of God in any fashion, to alter the Word of God in any fashion, is to attack the deity of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's a fundamental of the faith that we must be willing to die for the authority and infallibility of God's Word. Jesus, the true one, the holy one. But he also identifies himself as the one having the key of David. Now, we, we actually sang about this in the first uh, hymn we sang this morning. Uh, the last verse spoke of, the, O come, key of David, and open wide our eternal home. In that, in that great Christmas hymn, O come, O come, Emmanuel. What does this mean, though, that that he holds the key of David? Uh, This is a clear, direct reference to Isaiah 22. In Isaiah 22, we have this quote of this. Turn back there, please, in your Bibles to Isaiah 22. And notice this. This is what's called the Valley of Vision. Verse 1 of Isaiah 22 says, The burden of the Valley of Vision. Isaiah is burdened of the valley of vision in which he sees Jerusalem decimated and God's people in great affliction. That's why it's called the valley of vision. It's a low place in the visions that Isaiah got. It's a humbling place. It's a dreadful place because in this vision what he sees is he sees decimation and destruction over all of Jerusalem and the people of God. He sees his own people in in great affliction. But in that day Jehovah calls for repenting and sackcloth upon his people. And he calls his people in the valley of vision to repent and and to call out to humble themselves seeking for atonement for their sin which will bring this affliction upon them. This, of course, is prophetic of Israel, all nations for that matter, their need for redemption. But a warden of the house of Israel, he's described there in verse 5, it says, For it is a day of trouble and of, and of oppression, treading down, and of confusion by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and of crying to the mountains. Um, and Elam bare the quiver with chariots of men and horsemen, and Kur uncovered the shield. And you read about these individuals, Elam. And you'll read about another individual he'll talk about later over here in this text. Uh, verse 20. Um, um, lost my place there. Verse 15 says, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, give thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house. So this warden of the house of Israel, this Shebna, whoever this individual was, he says, Go speak to him and say, What hast thou here? And whom hast thou here? And thou hast hewed thee out a sepulcher here. What's he saying there? It's a poetic way of saying, You have decimated the odd city. You have been unfaithful in watching over the house, Shebna. You have, you have not done well. You have been a terrible leader of my people. But in verse 20, we see that he's going to replace Shebna. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girl. He's talking to Shebna. And I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulders, so he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, and all the vessels of small quantity. But even that nail be removed, and a greater nail will be put in its place, he'll say. One that's eternal. The last verse of this text. Well, this is all poetic and hard to fully understand and grasp, but what does he say? You can obviously see in Isaiah 22, 22, the direct quote from Revelation chapter 3, when he says that he has the key of David, and he openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Direct quote, right? From Isaiah 22, 22. What's this about? This is the point. You see, Shebna, representing the Jews who were leading the people of God in Jesus' day and many times, had failed. This is why Jesus calls the Pharisees, the religious leaders, sepulchers, graves. They'd selfishly pursued their own goodness and had not prepared the people for Jehovah with humble, repenting in sackcloth. They'd failed. But the name Eliakim means God sets up. And God will set up an authority under the, with the authority that Shebna had over the house of Israel. God will set up, set up Eliakim. He will be a stable peg in the wall and will not fail. But even Eliakim will be removed someday. But there is one coming who will be a strong, powerful certainty for God's people. Forever. He identifies himself, Jesus does in Revelation, as this fulfillment of Eliakim, as this peg in a strong place, as this sure place, this sure mark that all the glory of the house of Israel will hang upon Jesus. It's all based upon him. In fact, this text that we're reading about is a Christmas text. It's about the promise of the coming Messiah, that there is coming a perfect ruler over his house. And Jesus identifies himself as the perfect ruler of all nations and the perfect ruler over the house of Israel. A certain, unchanging, sure key of David. And what he opens, no one's able to shut. And what he shuts, no one's able to open. He is steadfast. He is resolute. He is sure. He is unchanging. And so Jesus, in speaking of himself as the key of David, is speaking to this church of the reality that you are in a pluralistic society. You are in a place where it's to hear this matter or that matter. And where those who were the leaders of my people, who you came from, who are persecuting you, the very ones who should understand your plight as followers of Messiah, the synagogue, they're not real Jews, they're liars, they're the synagogue of Satan. They are attacking you, they are fighting you. But don't worry, I am the the holy one. I am the true one and I'm the sure peg. I'm the one that stands firm and I will open the door for you and I will shut the door for them. And you have no one to fear because I am the very God of very God. Jesus begins this letter to the, this church with a great encouragement to encourage them that he is the one who opens and shuts. This, this, this business about opening and shutting the door. In verse 8, he addresses it again. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast had a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Jesus, possessing the key of David, first identifies himself with the royal authority that he alone, the Holy One, the True One, has all power and authority. And his authority is legally transferred through the family of David. And thus, Jesus, both God and man, is no pretender like Shebna was. He's no pretender. He cares for his church. He cares for his people. And he opens the door for them. And no one will be able to shut it. And although this church has little strength, is what he says there, they have kept his word and not denied his name. 
Many interpret this opening and shutting of a door as a door of evangelistic opportunity. In other words, they would say, well, this means that, that Jesus was going to open this door of evangelism to the church. I understand where that interpretation comes from, but it doesn't come from the immediate context. There's nothing in this context about evangelism. Rather, there is the context of a persecuted church who was, the door of the synagogue was closed to them. They were cast out of the synagogue. They were hated by all. There was hostility toward them. I see rather than the door here being a door of evangelistic opportunity, I see rather this is what the concept is. This is the door of God's eternal reward. This is the door of heaven. This is the door of a relationship with Him. And God Himself, Jesus, has opened this door. And when He opens the door, it doesn't matter how many times they cast them out of the synagogue. It doesn't matter how many times they curse them out. It doesn't matter how many times the world hates them. How many times the world calls them narrow-minded, bigots, and hateful. No matter how much the world attacks them, don't worry, Jesus says, I opened the door to my presence. You're good. I got it. They can't shut it. And when I shut the door on them, they can't open it. I am God who sustains you. I am the God who gives you my presence. And that's what he is saying here. The encouragement is the church must not become anxious or worry because it is Jesus who had opened this door of their hearts for them to hear and believe the gospel. It is Jesus who opens the hearts and minds of sinners and Jesus who closes them as well. And though the liars who are calling themselves God's people have cast them out of fellowship and relationship with the Old Testament covenants, though the church is weak, though they are small, they have little strength, they are faithful, and they need not fear their enemies because Jesus is the one who holds the key of David. He's the one who holds that which opens the door of the hearts. Jesus is their surety. Jesus is their hope and reward. I believe this analogy of the door and the opening and shutting fits better than the contextual, with the contextual flow of persecution and the synagogue of Satan than that God has simply enabled them to be evangelistic, although that is true. But what was it about this church that deserves such a profound introduction by Jesus? He says, I have the key of David. I alone have authority. I have opened a door for you into relationship with me. No one can shut that. Not, not you, but no one but you. Um, no one but, but me, but I can give you this relationship, can open this door. Do not fear those who are calling themselves Jews. This is quite the introduction. I'm the holy one, the true one. I'll make them come in and bow before your feet. That's what the word worship there literally means, to bow before your feet. I don't believe he's saying, I'll make them come worship you as if you are God. But rather, the word is proskuneo, to fall on your face. They're going to come to you and say, yes, you were right. Whether that means they will come in repentance or come in, in just having to recognize the authority of God over them. He says, I'm for you. I'm on your side. I'm the one that's opened the door for you. Do not fear. They will have to admit as every knee will bow and every tongue will confess not only that Jesus is Lord, but that Jesus' church is deeply loved. And that's what he says. They will must admit, in verse 9 he says, they will have to come before you. They will know this. I love you. Church, isn't that profoundly encouraging? You live in a world that is increasingly hostile to faith in Christ alone. You live in a world, a pluralistic society, that's not going to receive what you have to say. It's okay. Jesus is the one who opens the doors anyways. He's the one who shuts the doors. You don't have to worry about that. He'll take care of that. But isn't it still deeply troubling don't you turn on the news? Don't, don't you read things on the internet? And don't you sometimes just put your head in your hands and go, what are we going to do? 
I'm not talking about the economic trials or the headache of government or policies and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the fact that you can just sense and you can see that the truth of God's Word, the Christian things that He values, the moral principles of God's Word, and that which loves Christianity is more and more being attacked and hated by the world around us. And doesn't it kind of discourage you sometimes? And you just want to say, what's, wow, this world, what's, what's, what's going on? What are we supposed to do? How am I supposed to live? But Jesus comes back with this question and says, don't worry. One day, everyone in this world is going to know these three words. I love you. They don't, but I do. This greatly loved church of Philadelphia. What qualities did she express? What greatness did she achieve? I mean, isn't it amazing that Jesus Christ, the eternal God, who is the Holy One, the True One, who has all the royal authority of David, who is sovereign, that He looks at this church hated by those who call themselves religious, uh, that He would say quite profoundly, everyone else hates you, but there is coming a day when all your enemies will fall down before your feet and they will know that I love you. Well, what, what about this church was so magnificent? They would hear those sweet words of Jesus, I love you. Those words that we sing about in our children's songs. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Sweet words. Words that, that calm us when we're in our darkest days. When we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. When we are persecuted and afflicted and tormented. And it seems like nobody loves God. And nobody loves His church. And nobody loves the Word of God. But Jesus says, but I love you. That's sweet. That's precious. So what was it about this church? That would, that would garner such, such sweet, beautiful words and simple words from Jesus. What greatness was attached to this church that they would garner such an expression for the royal king of the universe? Before we can even answer that, we have to get something out of the way. First of all, this is what it was. They weren't great. They weren't. In fact, it says here, you have little strength. The word is the word dunamis. It means power, ability. Really, he's saying you have such hostility and you can't do anything. You're weak. You're small. You're really nothing. And I love you. And you're nothing. Most believe this description is not only ability but size. You're a small church without much ability. You don't have the cash, you don't have the personnel, you don't have the political, legal, or cultural sway. In fact, you're pretty insignificant. But isn't our God amazing? He tells us in the Old Testament to not despise the day of small things. He tells us in the New Testament to not pursue after greatness, but to simply serve. In fact, we know from Paul's epistles that he enjoys using the small and insignificant things to confuse the wise of this world. Men, the world applauds power and greatness and exceptionality. But Christ does not. Why not? Isn't God great and powerful? Isn't God strong and amazing? So why does he expect that from his church, his saints? He doesn't. And this is precisely why he doesn't demand or desire greatness of his people. Because he is God enough. He is strong enough. He doesn't need us to be great. He simply wants us to be faithful. We don't need to be amazing because he has got the amazing part down. He simply desires us to trust Him alone and walk in faith, resting in His amazing greatness. Are you feeling small, insignificant, of no account, useless, weak, and humiliated? Good. <laughs> now you're ready to see just what amazing is. And it's Jesus. There are two qualities that are rather ordinary that Jesus does commend in this church. 
Okay, here we go. They sent out hundreds of missionaries, right? They gave thousands to feed the poor. They had the greatest preachers that, that had worldwide recognition. They had a YouTube channel. No. No, this is it. You kept my word, and you didn't deny my name. That's it. That's the qualities of this church that Jesus says, I love you. You kept my word, and you didn't deny my name. Simply put, they obeyed God's word and stayed faithful in the end. We live in a church culture, an evangelical culture, that emphasizes the exceptional, that looks for the radical life, the unbelievable, that has in their vocabulary probably the most oxymoronic words, like have you ever heard of the phrase celebrity pastor? That's, that's a cr tr terrible oxymoronic word. You can't be a celebrity and a pastor. It's impossible according to the scripture. Yet we have that, and you hear, read about that, and you go on, and you listen to this celebrity pastor, and this celebrity pastor, and this big church, and this mega this, and this big this, and this fantastic this. This small group study will make your church radical. This one will, will change you, revolutionize your music ministry. This will make it like it's never been before. There's all this push in our church language to make something amazing and fantastic and radical and superb and excellent. And Jesus says, actually, I love you. You kept my word and you didn't have my name. You weren't radical. You weren't amazing. You were insignificant. You were little. You had little ability. But you didn't deny my name. That's it. Maybe we don't need awesome dads. Maybe we just need dads who will obey the word and bring their family to church, exemplifying submission under God's word day in and day out, rain or shine, tired or not. Maybe we don't need moms who can fix perfect organic vegetables and get the kids to soccer practice on time and volunteer with the PTA, perfectly hand make the kids' science project, uh, keep the house perfectly clean, have time to read the latest good housekeeping and look like, the mod like a modest centerfold. Maybe we don't need that. Maybe we need moms who will teach their children God's word and not deny his name. Teen, you don't need to be spectacular at anything. Just know and obey God's word and stand gently and quietly for the name of Christ when all around you are not. That's it. It's simple. It's not fantastic. It's rather insignificant. But you know what we need to do? We need to get out of the way so the world sees an awesome God. Not fantastic people. Maybe we don't need to be awesome because Jesus already is. Maybe we need to be faithful and obedient to the bitter end. The churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia contained no rebuke in their letters. And both churches were persecuted by the synagogue of Satan and by the world around them. And they were simply faithful servants of Jesus Christ. That's it. Notice he says that you have kept the word of my patience. They obeyed my word to steadfastly endure is what that means. So the hour of trial which is coming upon the whole world, I will keep you from that, he says. Now clearly, most take this to be the seven-year tribulation that will afflict the world spoken of in the rest of Revelation. And although there's disagreement as to whether this means keep as in be raptured out before the tribulation or keep as in protect you while you go through the tribulation, I tend to believe he's referring to being raptured out prior to the tribulation that will afflict the whole world simply because that's being consistent with the meaning of the word keep in the context. Protected from... Whatever this means, and I believe that's what it means, he's saying, listen, you're not going to endure the great affliction I'm bringing upon this world. But understand in the cultural context, the Philadelphians knew something of tribulation. The great earthquake, as we mentioned before, that Pliny called the worst disaster in human memory, had devastated the city of Philadelphia. She never fully recovered. As I said, many of her people lived in fear of another earthquake and refused to rebuild. She experienced many other tremors. But this promise is... A spiritual one, not a physical one. Not that they would have no more earthquakes, but that the great judgment of God when He shakes the whole earth in this tribulation period will not affect them. God will protect them because He loves them. And then He says, lest they forget He is coming quickly. Hold fast what you have. That is, your patient endurance and obedience. You believe keep believing. You trust, keep trusting. You repented, keep repenting. 
You see, the Christian life is one lived in the present, not a glimpse in the divine past, distant past. You see, we have assurance that we are God's children, not because of something we have done, some prayer we have prayed, but because of what God has done now and what we are doing by, the, by that power of God alone. So, the believer believes, the repentant repents, the confessor confesses, the faithful is faithful. Hold fast. So you do not lose your Stephanos, your reward, your crown. Not your salvation, your reward. But the commendation of a race well done. The motiv motivation of the believers is the Bema seat where we will receive commendations for keeping His word and not denying His name. So He says, hold fast to this. There's reward coming. It's coming to an end. So the, the, the encouragement is this. The encouragement in tribulation is this. I love you. <laughs> Jesus says, I love you. That's the encouragement. But there's a secondary encouragement and that's, it. that's this. It's not always going to be this way. It's not always going to be this way. Friends, we need to understand that. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand that. Yes, in this life, we will face hostility and persecution. In this life, our encouragement is He loves us in spite of all of this. We are weak. He is strong. Trust Him. But that's not the only encouragement He gives. The other encouragement is, and it's not going to go on forever. It won't go on forever. I will keep you from the day of trial. I'll keep you from that. I'll guard you. I'll protect you. I'll give you the Stephanos, the crown, the reward for well-run race. I'll give it to you. Hold fast. Hold on. Don't let go. Keep going. And then he gives us the reward to the victor, the Christian, the overcomer. Christ grants two promises. As with all the conclusions to the letters, these rewards are applied first to the particular church, then to all Christians. And this is our joy. In the text of Scripture, that the one who overcomes, he says, will be made by God a pillar in his holy temple and will no more go out. Do you catch that little phrase there, will no more go out? Do you see the context here? The synagogue of Satan, the Jews, cast them out of their synagogue, which if you're a Jewish person, and the Christians were a subset of the Jewish people culturally in that day, that was to lose everything. The world didn't want them. The religious didn't want them. They were cast out. Don't worry. I'm the one who opened the door. I'm the one who shuts the door, he says. And when all this is done, you're going to go into my temple, my holy temple, and you're going to be a pillar in there, and you're never going to go out. No one can ever take that from you. What does this mean? You'll be a pillar in the temple of God. Some think, because the ideas abound as to what this means, that it's picturing the massive Greek pillars, the massive Greek temples that would see around them. Others think it's a reference to the two pillars at the entrance of Solomon's temple in Chronicles, Joachim and Boaz. Really, I don't know. But the word pillar is a foundational element. And we would consider this small church with little strength in Philadelphia was steadfastly enduring, though they were earthly citizens of a once strong city, weakened by the massive earthquakes. One passionately loyal to Rome, though they were per, per, uh, persevering in this hostile environment as a small, weak, insignificant people. One day, God was going to make them the strong pillars of His temple, His presence. This reminds me of the encouragements we've seen at every one of these conclusions of the letters where He encourages them, You're mine. I'm coming back. I'll return. You'll rule with me. You'll be a pillar in my temple. They'll fall down before you and say, You were right. I've got it. I've got it. They must have felt overwhelmed, maybe so close to losing all faith, but they were hanging on. And he uses the double negative here where he says, I will never, the word is double negative, no, not, never, ever go out. You'll never leave. <coughs> I'm coming quickly. Hold fast. 
It makes sense to me that the encouragement he will give is that though today you feel weak and uncertain and are trembling, when I come and take, with, take you with me into my kingdom, you will be as a strong pillar in my temple. The eternal temple of God is the place of forever worship before God's throne. There will be no weakness in you, no persecution, no smallness, no little strength when you stand as mighty pillars before my throne. While all your persecutors run and flee from my presence. And remember, I, Jesus, opened the door to you. No one can and shut it. Those liars who persecute you, they think they have cast you out of my assembly by removing you from their synagogue, which is really the synagogue of Satan. But no one will be able to remove you from my eternal temple. In essence, Jesus is encouraging this small, overwhelmed church and encouraging all believers that those who are in Christ indeed will steadfastly endure and that there is no reason to fear what man can do to us. As Martin Luther said, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still and he must win the battle. The second encouragement and in conclusion here is Christ will write upon the enduring saint the name of God, Jehovah, and the name of God's city, Jerusalem, coming down from heaven. And Christ's new name, he is Jehovah. And this all symbolically encouraging because they may feel absolutely insignificant as nothing and poor and weak and needy. But one day they're going to have emblazoned across them God's name, His possession, your mind. No one can take that away. <coughs> Eternally secure in Christ. No reason for anxiety. He will make all things right. And we will finally see just what it means that we are His chosen ones when He imprints upon us His holy name, His truth. Beloved, we are swiftly approaching a time in our current social construct when we will find ourselves more like the Church of Philadelphia, small, weak, and of little ability. But I'm reminded of the precious hymn recently written still my soul be still and do not fear the winds of change may rage tomorrow God is at your side no longer dread the fires of unexpected sorrow God you are my God and I will trust in you and not be shaken Lord of peace renew a steadfast spirit within me to rest in you alone still my soul be still do not be moved by lesser lights and fleeting shadows. Hold on to His ways with shield of faith against temptation's flaming arrows. Still, my soul be still. Do not forsake the truth you have learned in the beginning. Wait upon the Lord and hope will rise as stars appear when day is dimming. Though we be few and small, Though you be overwhelmed by the afflictions of life and the persecution of the religious and the irreligious alike, though you are persecuted by your own heart and mind, take comfort. Christ is the Holy One. He is the True One. He has the key of David. All sovereign authority is His. And when He has opened the door and brought us in, He shuts and no one is able to open. Because thou little in ability, though little in ability, He is great in power. And we simply keep His word and do not deny His name. Those who hate our God and hate truth and hate us will one day fall in front of us. And they will, in the whole world, will know the depth of love that Jesus the Messiah has for you. As we keep His word, reminding us to be patient, He will keep us from the hour of tribulation that will afflict the whole earth. Jesus is coming back soon. So, beloved, let us continue to hold fast the faith of Jesus Christ. Let us grasp onto His Word and hope of His coming, knowing that we will receive the reward of Christ Himself. We who are truly saints, who are victors, we may be little strength now, and we may be outcasts of the world, but we will be made like a strong pillar before God's temple above, and we will never ever lose that privilege. He will inscribe His possessive trait upon us in care of God's name, our eternal address, New Jerusalem, signed by Jesus Himself. Listen, my beloved, there is a brighter day coming. He's coming back. And so Jesus says to His church, I love you. Let's pray. Let's pray.